Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to the session on the arts, harnessing the power of human imagination. And uh, I'm here with uh, overcome them and rejoin us. Um, I have to say that um, as I was thinking in advance about today's sessions, I had some doubts about how to grasp a topic as vast as the human imagination. As I was looking over the hundreds of other topics being uh, discussed in this conference, I noticed that many of them had something to do with the idea of trust. And I assume this has something to do with the rise of various populisms around the world as a result of the declining legitimacy of established authorities, even of scientific expertise. I began to realize that in a very different form, similar questions bedevil the world of art. Authority is under question. Today, we are hyper-conscious that questions of whose visions get relayed and disseminated to inspire others is a political one. For many of the artists who made what we call modernism, the task of disseminating art belonged to artists themselves. The Impressionists in Paris broke the hold of the salons and academies. Likewise, at the end of the 19th century, uh, secessions uh, from established institutions arose in Munich, Vienna, and Berlin. No juries, no prizes, was the great slogan of the Society of Independent Artists in New York. By now, the art institutions have reasserted themselves and are more important than ever to the culture of art. Artists are not primarily validated by each other, let alone by critics, but by the schools that credential them and then uh, especially the museums that purchase or exhibit their work. And then, uh, of course, there's the matter of galleries and of auction prices. That the values and priorities of art institutions remain disconnected from those of artists is something we were reminded of again by the recent episode of the postponement of a Philip Gustin retrospective at the National Gallery in Washington, a postponement that was denounced by hundreds of prominent artists. The museum, fearing that it could not defend its own judgment of artistic value, acted out of anxiety about its relationship to its public. But if artists are renewing their critique of the institutions, they may be too late. The gatekeeping institutions may already have lost the upper hand. In our new cultural reality, torn between neoliberalism and populism, it's finally been widely realized that, as my friend the art theorist Thierry de Duve has long insisted, if, since Duchamp, anything can be art, it is more significantly the case that anyone can be an artist. And if that is so, then perhaps the name of artist no longer carries much weight. Who says that those who call themselves artists know more about art than anyone else? If so-called creatives have replaced artists, if a teenager dancing on TikTok has a larger public and a greater influence than Mark Morris, or if a JPEG by a digital illustrator is accorded more worth than a painting by Carrie James Marshall or a sculpture by Louis Bourgeois, then the value of artistic value is something that we need to rethink. And perhaps new secessions are called for. Uh, I'm going to ask my fellow panelists to, to speak in... Um, alphabetical order by first names. So, uh, Annie, why don't, why don't you uh, go ahead? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Um, and thanks for that. It yeah, has for interesting introduction. So um, I'm happy to be part of this gathering and be here with my fellow panelists. So my work is as an artist, writer, and educator, and currently I'm the director of School of Art and Design at San Diego State University. 
So over my time, I've worked in many different areas of the arts and always with an interest at the intersections of art and social justice. Um, I worked in public education. Many of my students are first generation college students. And since 2013, I've been fortunate to collaborate with people in and out of the prison system to create and run Prison Arts Collective, um, a program supported by transformative arts from the California Arts Council and the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. So what interests me the most about this surreal time that we're living in is how it puts our experience into high relief. And similar to what Barry was talking about with the art world, looking at what really matters. That's what this time is asking of us, what really matters. And when we look at art, it's kind of a type of reckoning. Where, where are we and where do we want to go? So in many ways, contemporary art in the past few decades has really become synonymous with the market and the system of galleries and auction houses and art fairs that sustain it, which is electric and vital and important, but um, not all that art has been or can be. So I think about a rebirthing of the art world that would be inclusive of these different satellite art worlds with communities and institutions in different parts of the world. Um, in my work at Prison Arts Collective, I see firsthand how art can transform lives and communities. I've met artists that create um, out of what they have at hand, peeling ink off of old magazines to mix with water to make paint, folding scraps of paper found on the floor into elegant building blocks to build a replica of a ship. Um, when he was in solitary confinement, Tony Ramirez made a series of paintings of President Obama using coffee that came through his slot um, in his face as paint and stray hairs found on the floor to make a brush. Um, Mark Taylor, when he was incarcerated, took our arts facilitator training and merged what he learned from the arts class with what he knew from lifers groups and co-created a class where he led his students um, through a process of looking at their past through creative writing. Um, another artist who I know who was in our programs, Wendy Stagg, shares that a friend of hers who was on Suicide Watch shared that it was only in the art space that she felt at peace. So at the start of March last year, we had been facilitating classes on 17 yards in 11 prisons across the state of California. On March 12th, we put them all on pause. And since then, we have made and sent over 2,000 distance learning packets, 10 videos, and a radio show. Our students are experiencing the immeasurable challenge of being imprisoned during a deadly pandemic, cut off from their families and from each other. So what can these lessons of art and art history possibly offer? So we weren't sure, but we had to try. So we started hearing back from our students and they thanked us for remembering them, but they also shared profound thoughts on the meaning of art. One wrote, oftentimes using our imagination and creativity is the only escape from our physical and social isolation. Another said simply, this experience made me feel like a part of something. So this sense of freedom, connection, and imagination is the most essential role of art during a deadly pandemic. And I posit that it holds the seeds for the next iteration of the art world. Thank you, David. You, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're next alphabetically because I think some of um, the things that Annie talked about really chime in with uh, ideas uh, I've heard from you in the past about wild art that exists outside the confines of the uh, the art establishment. Thanks, Barry. Uh, what I will do is I'm starting the timer here for minutes, and literally I'll, I'll get this. I'll just read, and then we'll I'll stop. Uh, when, when the buzzer goes. And my title is The Recent Sudden Death of Our Art World. Just a year ago, without any warning, no one prepared art world died. For decades, as long as I'd been writing art criticism, long distance travel had been relatively easy and relatively inexpensive, and you could see a great deal of art in the United States, in Europe, in New York City alone. There were four major museums, many smaller ones, a lot of galleries, and it was simply not possible to see everything that was interesting at that point. Now, of course, uh, that's changed very suddenly. Making art and judging art has always been a social activity. If you go 
way back to the 18th century, Diderot, when he reflects on the Louvre salons in 1767, uh, he would be astonished by comparison of the art we see in Venice or at the, uh, the Carnegie or at the Whitney, but he would understand how it was displayed and he would understand the role of the social critic whose judgments aspire to uh, guide public response, though he wrote for a different sort of audience. Um, this is the condition of art. It's been the condition of art for a long time. Now, of course, the uh, coronavirus has destroyed the social roots of our art world. Um, some commercial galleries are closing. Others are restricting attendance. Museums are laying off staff and so forth. Every country, it seems, is having these sorts of problems. Now, it does seem to me historically that breakdown of social institutions is often traumatic. Think, if you will, grandly of 1911 when three long lasting states, the Austro Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and Russia uh, disappeared. Or we'll look at what happened in Europe and communist Europe in 1989. And it seems, maybe, that we're at such a change now uh, that there's this change which is completely unpredictable. Now, the question is, uh, obviously, what's going to happen? A lot of galleries and museums, as we all know, are creating remote exhibitions. You can see the works online. Uh, I don't think anyone is satisfied with that situation. Some editors are more willing to accept those reviews than others, but it's simply not the same sort of experience. When you're in a gallery you can move around freely and you can overhear other people. And that's simply different from sitting at your own computer, even if you have a monitor, even if, as with us today, thank God we have all this technology and we can talk to each other. Um, capitalism has always expanded. That's been the story since the French Revolution or a little earlier. 1793, when the art museum was expanded and when it's added art from everywhere, from Africa, from Australia, from the Islamic world, and so forth. And, of course, the contemporary art collections have uh, vastly uh, expanded. That seems to be, at the present moment, in a kind of halt. And so the obvious dramatic question is what's going to happen. But that's four minutes. You're not going to tell us what's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> that's for the discussion. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, Julia, maybe you'll tell us what's going to happen. I will. I will. <laughs> and, uh, uh, David, I love your T-shirt. I, I appreciate the Cyrillic in public. Um, all right. So, uh, I actually, I'm going to um, start with the definition of trust. Um, which I just looked up. And uh, so the, the tag words for trust are reliability, truth, ability, or strength of something or someone. So I used to think um, of uh, art, uh, well, art making. I used to think that the social duty of the creative process was um, to the individual viewer, not to the collective. And so it always instinctively made sense to me, as Dave Hickey put it, that art is an individual sport. And I took it as an axiom that um, what Marcel Duchamp asserted in his uh, 1957 um, paper talk, The Creative Act, when he said that art is a collaborative process between the artist and a spectator. So still an individual activity. But two recent events um, challenged this very firm belief system that I held. Um, and uh, so the first one of them was this much discussed opening of a uh, cause exhibition that's Brian Donnelly at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, cause, uh, of course, he uh, erases the line between uh, fine art and product. 
and a uh, museum store sells uh, little uh, miniatures of the artworks that are not semiotic signs exactly of the artworks as it usually is in the museum store, but just different to scaled artworks. So with cause, uh, you have uh, uh, basically, well, at least two ways to spin it. The negative interpretation would be, uh, again, uh, related to trust, the loss of reliability in the definition of art. And the positive interpretation would be inclusivity. And I'll come back to that later. Inclusivity in terms of um, uh, including popular culture and culture of reference uh, to uh, into the so-called fine art. And cause art is all about references. Um, so the second event was uh, something that Barry already mentioned, was the uh, uh, last week's auction sale of an NFT, non-fungible token, for the eye-watering price of $69 million by Christie's. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a massively important event in the art world, and um, uh, so it uh, might signify the end, it might signify the beginning, but it was significant. And a very interesting theme emerged in the commentary uh, from both uh, the millennial direction, Jerry Gagosian on Instagram, reference to Beeples, whose image was sold uh, as uh, artwork uh, cannibalizing itself. And from the boomer camp, um, Peter Sheldahl refers to cause work as beyond kitsch, quote unquote, and self cannibalizing. So until last week, uh, I actually, my plan was to speak about uh, the loss of trust, uh, referencing this very embarrassing incident with the Gustin exhibition, postponed, repostponed, and um, the idea of uh, changing uh, this exhibition based on the argument of impact and group identity and all that. But following this NFT earthquake uh, of last week, I'm afraid that we kind of have to really rethink the larger issues of where we're heading. And without it, uh, I don't think the trust can be restored. So is it the time to let everybody in, uh, cause NFTs, uh, uh, any, sort of, uh, um, uh, any sort of shift that uh, makes um, a claim uh, to existence? Uh, and uh, so with ever increasing tendency to to singularity, uh, we all depend on our smartphones to an unbelievable extent. Uh, uh, I think that there will be more and more attempts to break the citadel of individuality by inclusivity of uh, uh, inclusivity of uh, late cat capitalist consumerism, identity, financial instruments, whatnot. So now, again, uh, I see two spins on that. The positive one would be okay, let's just go with that. Embrace the fact, which has been um, uh, already uh, it pointed out by, uh, well, not pointed out, but it, at the base of Buddhism, which is that we're all interconnected. So uh, forget the individual. And the negative spin would be that by uh, thinking that there are many truths, uh, we will lose the ability to find truth. So uh, to... to um, uh, uh, to summarize this, I think that in order to rebuild trust, what we need to do is to agree on whether art is an individual sport or it's sort of like a Twitter clubhouse-like swarm activity uh, where group consensus supplants individual imagination. Thank you. Uh, well, I guess for now we still don't have Lance with us, so we'll Hope that he'll come back still, and we'll go on to Martin. Yeah, well, guys, uh, very inspiring. <laughs> My head is still spinning from listening to you guys. Um, I'm a photographer. I'm born in Germany. I've been living in New York for over 20 years. And uh, I worked with Andy Woods for a couple of years, and uh, I had a conflict with a New Yorker for 13 years. And, uh, you know, my, my whole workflow has completely shifted from being primarily, let's say, 90% of my work being done for magazines and being an editorial photographer. Um, and now with the, with the demise of the publishing world, um, you know, as you all are well aware, there's the budgets have gone from $30,000 to $1,000 for some cover photo shoots. And, um, and the most many magazines I work for have folded, and the ones that still exist are a third of the size. So, 
um, you know, to get to your point, Julia, I don't think it's up to, you know, it's up to the masses. They're making the decisions. You know, we can sit here and say, uh, we wish things were working that way. But the, the truth is that people are not buying magazines anymore. And um, as we all know, a lot of bad art sells. You know, if, um, I remember I was in my, uh, my gallery here in Chelsea a while ago and an art collector walked in and uh, was looking at a different photographer's picture and she said, do you notice anything? And she was pointing at the picture. I was looking at her. I'm like, no. And she's like, look at me. I'm wearing the same shoes as a model in the photograph. And she bought the picture because for that reason, because she wanted to hang it over her dining room table so to see if guests would notice. And that is not, you know, that is what de that determines uh, the secondary art market prices often and that determines what sells in, in even in Chelsea galleries. So... I'm, I feel like very helpless. I have obviously always uh, admired museum curators that uh, uh, you know have a great taste in discovering new artists and finding people that are truly unique. You know, for me, my idea of a, and that's why I don't really, I call myself more a photographer. My friends say you have to call yourself an artist. You're having museum shows, you have gallery shows, you have Schneider books, but I still, you know, I don't think my, my work is necessarily reinventing the language of photography. That's why, you know, I have this high idea of what an artist is um, in a sense of really trying to do. And the problem is I don't really see much of it. Um, but, um, you know, makeup people are called makeup artists. And every graphic designer is considered an artist. And, you know, um, so the term artist is... Is I think different for everybody. Some, some, you know, our actors are artists. I guess um, who's not an artist? Um, I think also a lot of people that work in the world of banking or uh, uh, are lawyers. They're very creative. You know, not in a good direction. Not that they do anything good to their creativity, but they're coming up with very creative ways of reinterpreting laws to be able to cheat the system to. Uh, gain uh, financial uh, uh, financial gains or financial advantages within a constructed legal system. Um, you know, I I hate the internet. I hate the new development. I love magazines, but on the other hand, I now have Instagram and I'm able to be my own publisher. You know, with my own stories. Um, I did a story on death row exonerees lately, and I because I work for National Geographic. I have over, I have 1.2 million views on one video, you know. That is more than the entire American, probably like close to what, you know, more than the New Yorker, let's say that. It's like, you know, uh, and, uh, and a younger demographic and spread out all over the world. So, sorry, <laughs> I didn't have anything pre-written, but I found you were, your comments so interesting. I want to make it also the format a little bit looser, having watched these things. You have know, five people giving a speech. You know, I think the audience of seven people can easily get lost. So, mm. um, yeah, I wanted to see if um, you have any questions. Or mm -hmm. I, I think I have a question, uh, and it, it's something that I think arises from uh, the fact that I – came into the world of art in the 1980s when it had a very particular structure and consistency that was pretty legible. Uh, and things have changed a lot since then. And I think um, what you're, and I, also I should say that even though our topic is called the arts, uh, actually we're not talking about the arts in general because we're all coming from the field of, visual, so-called visual arts, photography, painting, sculpture, and so on, conceptual art. Um, and I think what you're pointing to, Martin, also speaks to uh, something that Julia was saying about this dichotomy that she posited between the individual and the swarm. And uh, the fact is, I think that there are, there are things in between. 
there there are groups and there are um if you know to if you want to use that kind of term there are demographics you know there are constituencies uh for different things and uh when i think about the field of music for instance uh i don't think anyone any longer imagines that music is one thing and that it for instance means uh you know what happened in european concert halls between 1800 and you know 1989 or something like that uh you know there's there there are many different musics and they each have their um their aficionados and the people who are passionate about them and some may take more of cognizance of things that are outside their immediate realm other ones are very much fixated on their thing whether it's hip hop or classical music or jazz or um indian classical music or uh whatever it is uh no one expects there to be one institution that unites all of music in itself Barry, uh, think- there there are concert halls that are platforms like carnegie hall can have uh a jazz musician one night and a classical musician the next but uh but there's no collection why do we expect the art world to be a singular thing that encompasses everything i think that's really helpful and i would go back maybe to our discussion of prisons and other examples and say look I mean, no one can claim to be an expert on all of this. I mean, it'd be a kind of air of absurdity of saying, "Well, I'm a formalist critic, and here I'm going to look at this prisoner's work and see what she or he is making." Right? But I mean, I think part of what's going on for all of us here is the sense that the the realm of the critic has become marginal and is sort of blown out to sea. That the idea that there can be some kind of trust in the critic and some sort of expertise and that we have good taste or historical judgments or whatever those things seem to be more and more problematic and that means that the whole activity is hard to justify no? well, but the, the the critic i mean the, the the critics if we look at the position at the um prestige of the critic throughout the 20th century the heyday of course was in the uh 50s in wow. the 40s in the 50s so in comparison to that uh we're already in the ditch but it doesn't make uh it doesn't make criticism irrelevant uh so perhaps criticism doesn't drive production anymore but uh uh it and 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 with all various platforms where you could publish your criticism so i mean you can go on substack and and publish it there if your editor is too harsh so there's no it's it's a, it's a responsive creative activity so that's not going away and and just what was martin was saying is yeah i mean the the ecosystem changed so you go from the uh $1000 cover to $1000 cover and but you you do acquire other ways of uh dispersing your work and the high viewership on your video proves that So so there I mean it just that the system is changing certainly right yeah. and the only yeah. thing that changes it is how, you know how do artists now make a living you know I, young people want to be photographers and I'm always like I don't know guys you know it's uh it's in very you know when I started out it was hard but at least there was I felt like there was the possibility but now Yeah. Living strictly with photography, unless you want to be a wedding photographer or still life photographer, it's gotten really, really hard. And then if once you're an artist, people can copy your work more easily, or they they syndicate your work and steal your work for blogs, you know. Um, Something that I th- think. Oh, I was just gonna. I think like your question, Barry, about the music. The comparison with the music is a good one because I think that in visual art, it has gotten more around like one primary art and then everything else is other like by nature of the word outsider right like outside what or non western which really is really pejorative and it's time to change it but what too and i think that that's the question for art like how will it hold different histories and traditions without sacrificing 
the history and tradition, right? The role of the critic, the role of the knowledgeable person to look at something and have that, um, you know, have that view. I think that it's just a time that we're going to have to redefine it. Like the idea of art, I, used, I would always talk to my students and say, they always say, like to your point, Martin, so often the students are like, well, everything is art. And that's just their ideas, this sort of big mass of everything is creative, so everything is art. So I'll usually ask them, well, if everything is art, then nothing is art, then there is no art. It's almost like the death of art to just say it's everything. So how do we hold this pluralism without sacrificing the specificity of each tradition? Well, then why don't we have you two, uh, museum, you are both work at museums. How do you pick your artists? What are your criteria for saying this person is an artist and this person isn't? You work with prisoners, you consider their work art, They've never had any formal training. Is that there any? Is that for your art? So I don't work in a museum, but I do consider it art. I don't think it has to have formal training to be art. I think that, but I also work in education and have for years, so I value formal training. I just don't think it's the only pathway. I think there's multiple pathways. Like we had one artist, you talk about the word artist, and I think that's a really good question to understand what that means. And to people who aren't from that tradition, like, for example, this one guy I know inside the prison named Shannon, who's been making art his whole life. I'm sure it's how he survives the trauma he's experiencing. And his art is quite fascinating. And he's never been trained. And so he never called himself an artist. So our grad student came in and was teaching a class and said, hey, man, you're an artist. And he still to this day talks about that moment and and has trouble accepting it because it is such an important term to him. Yeah, I think well, um, sorry, can I just bring this up because it, it, it points toward a question that's come from uh, our, our tiny audience uh, and uh, Dr. Dembrowski in the audience who's asking about how or if we make a distinction between an expressive art, meaning something that anyone can do to express themselves uh, in relation to fine arts uh, that perhaps are considered something that professional artists uh, create for a larger public. Is that, is that a relevant distinction? Yeah, actually. So to Dr. Dombrowski's question, the thing I was going to say is uh, in 1921, so a hundred years ago now, uh, a book was published by uh, Dr. Margenthaler about his patient, uh, whose last name is Wu Flee. Uh, he was a Swiss um, artist. He was uh, confined to an asylum early on in his life, and he spent the rest of his life there for predatory pedophilia. And he himself was supremely traumatized uh, throughout his youth. And so that sort of expressive art has been acknowledged as art. 1921, then there's a book by Prince Horn, which is a collection of um, um, uh, art from also... Uh, mental institutions, and it's called The Art of the Mentally Ill. And all of that has been completely subsumed into surrealism as legitimate art and in a way of escaping this sort of corrupted, institutionalized, highly trained but not sincere art that, as they saw it, of the tradition, which was bred by the civilization, which resulted in this horrible Great War, the First World War, so in, in, in the process of looking for ways uh, of art that is different and more authentic and more expressive, uh, they did look back to, to, to people who were not trained artists and who were highly traumatized. So that's, I mean, it's been there for 100 years. So what Amy is doing is that within this venerable tradition of uh, not just art therapy, but recognizing those outsider artists as legitimate artists alongside with everybody else trained. I think that's important, and I think that my experience is when you go to art schools, you find that there's a lot of interest in what was described here as a kind of self-therapy art about yourself, about your identity, and so forth, and, and that leads into the larger interest of the art world. I don't think you can separate the two. It's a very important strain, in, in including all the gallery art and all the museum art. I mean, think of how much art is around gender identity and political identity and so forth, all those things. I think that's a part of it. I think this is all great. I do think, though, that what's sort of broken down, to go back to various points, is the question that, that and I'd like to hear people say about this, 
that the critic has any kind of authority or that the audience feels they can, as it were, trust the critic to make that. I don't know. Does anyone want to take that on? I mean, because once you get into a kind of selfhood, you know, my art is about expressing myself, my identity, and so forth. When you say this is fascinating, this is really important, but then it becomes harder to. I mean, my experience in visiting art schools, but then it becomes harder to, to offer some kind of critical perspective. Well, but the critics are just educated. I mean, these are critics or viewers who uh, write down their thoughts. And uh, I read both uh, yours and uh, Barry's uh, criticism with great interest and, and, and uh, um, you know, also, um, um, uh, of course, uh, Peter Sheldell's. And uh, it's extremely informative and very important. And it doesn't mean that I don't look at art by myself. So it's right. not it's not a substitute. It's um, right. I mean we're the sauce, you know. We're the uh, the salt. I don't know. I mean, it, it just, yeah. I'd like to think that a critic has credibility more than authority. In other words, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't want someone to say, "Oh, just because uh, Schwabsky says that right. Bryce Martin is a good painter." I'll just accept Bryce Martin as a good painter. I don't have to think about it anymore. I'd like them to think, oh, well, he had some interesting things to say about that that I wouldn't have thought of otherwise, and, and therefore I can look again at Bryce Martin and see, oh, yeah, it's more interesting than I thought. Or, you know, I mean, there's, there's, a, yeah. a, there's no aspiration to that kind of I, uh, legislative ability there. I think that's true. I think that the critics are to, it's like we're the, well, I don't know if I consider myself that anymore, but I was, but <laughs> more knowledgeable viewers in a way. It's like we're taking more time, bringing more to it, and then bring that to others. But I also think it's really fascinating to talk to people, to talk with people about art who maybe don't have that depth of knowledge and do bring kind of similar to what Julie was saying about the artist bringing a, this other perspective, which might be more authentic or more expressive because they don't know, right? And I think that's true of viewers too, that it can be sometimes the person who like, it's their first art class or they don't really know, but they happen to like it, who brings this new perspective that we hadn't thought about. I mean, it'll be lacking the full context and the full history and they'll look to critics for that. But I do think it's like the most interesting conversations I've had about art were at a community college class I taught where my students were from like 16 to like 80 and from I think eight different countries of origin. And it was just fascinating to talk about art with them. Did they have the whole experience and all the degrees that I had? No, so it's different, but it was interesting. So I guess it's more of just holding space for different perspectives. I love that comment, and I would hope that that could be true. Uh, I mean, it's the sort of ideal, if you want to, uh, sorry, an academic reference, Jürgen Habermas and all this, mm -hmm. and we all talk, and out of this we get some kind. But I don't know, I, it's not very skeptical. I'll give one example. I worked for a while in the past now for hyperallergic, and people could post comments and you might think, well, the post the comment already, I mean, this is a site you have to look for. You're not just wandering. You have to look for it. But I must say, the comments, with a few exceptions, were really disappointing in the limited ability to argue. The, the mm -hmm. one really one, and I mean, this is an elliptical comment, but you can figure it out, was when I reviewed a Soviet show in Israel, whoa, did I get comments? Boy. Did you know the Fourth International still lives? I didn't know. I had to learn that, you know. But I mean, what I what I'm saying in response to you, not critically, but the, the, I would love to have this kind of discussion like we're having now, okay? But very hard to get that going. Very I think it's yeah. Maybe it's the context because the samples that I'm giving are coming from a controlled context of a classroom where people learned a similar thing and there's a dialogue and they're not being recorded and it's not for the public. So maybe that's the issue is putting it into a public sphere in the internet, which is, you know, highly problematic in relationship to these types of issues. Well, if I can just jump that's a good that. point. 
could you get the prisoners to, to get in a dialogue when you talk to them about their work? So yeah, they, we bring, the first thing we do actually is bring in art history and bring in examples throughout time. And because most of the art there is realistic painting because that's what they know. So we bring in surrealism and institutional yeah. critique and conceptual and what have you. And then their art starts to evolve and their discussion with it. That's utopia. I've gone the whole wrong direction. I, <laughs> I don't it's, think so. It's, Well, I've just gotten a, a notification that our uh, time is soon to run out, I guess in five minutes. Um, I don't know whether we all <laughs> want to make a last uh, comment or, or where where this has led us. I mean, I think in a way what the, I thought about what, with what you just said, uh, David, and about the comments section uh, relates to why it was that several years ago, after having been on Facebook for a while, I quit Facebook because uh, basically the discussions that went out on there, uh, even though there were actually a few people who used their patients to have very interesting discussions about art. Like I remember Matthew, um, what is his name? Matthew, the English former art critic who's, who now is an artist who used to be on TV in England. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, Matthew, whatever his name was. He edited Art Scribe magazine when I wrote there in the 80s. He did and a couple of other artists. And uh, But for the most part, uh, basically what Facebook revealed to me was uh, – how how unintelligent all the people that I thought were in in my in my realm <laughs> turned out to be, and how they you know how they couldn't uh, have an argument without just uh, lambasting each other on uh, personal issues. So I had to uh, quit. So I, th I I mean I think it is true that we need situations in which there is a. Um, uh, where the structure of the situation gives some sense of aspiration toward a higher uh, level of insight. Agreed. And very, if I can, I remember decades ago, the panel I was on, and you had to say to one audience member, Would you please stop undressing? Well, that was a. That was a <laughs> Right. Well, Facebook is dead for all intents and purposes, but there are <laughs> platforms where you could uh, uh, converse and everybody's let in and, um, and uh, you know, it's as good as the speaker. There's hope. Sure, I agree. There's hope. And one last question for you. How do you feel about the cancel culture and, you know, as you mentioned, the show at the Brooklyn Museum that was uh, Cancer Poussin, um based out of fear for potential backlash. Uh, well, the show that I mentioned was, was not at the Brooklyn Museum, but at the National Gallery. And it was, it was delayed, and then uh, the delay was sem semi-rescinded after a lot of objections uh, came up. I, uh, as again, I don't, I don't really believe personally that there's such a thing as cancel culture. I think that's just uh, a kind of phrase that people throw out whenever, like now our um, our governor uh, here in New York City, because he's been accused of sexual harassment, is complaining about cancel culture too. Well, uh, I don't know, but um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I think that uh, institutions no longer feel like their position in, insulates them from criticism and they're not used to it. And mm -hmm. they're learning how, I hope they're learning how uh, to handle it so that they don't have to feel like they need to cancel anything that might be controversial, but they can, uh, uh, you know, they can deal with it. Right. And, but it's also, it's, so the bad direction to 
uh, kind of chime in is the self-censorship. And this is what happened with the case of Gustin. That wasn't cancel culture. And again, even if you believe in the phenomenon, which um, uh, is very amorphous, but it was self-censorship in, uh, I, I don't remember how Barry put it really well in his introduction. It was uh, the nervousness, right? Is that what you said? Uh, fear, I said, but yeah, nervousness, whatever. Right. So that's, that, that's uh, and, and it's a thing. It's definitely a thing. And uh, again, that kind of feeds into this idea of that uh, there's this swarm mentality and, you know, step to the right, step to the left, uh, you get shot. Um, I'm saying this as a former Soviet, so. <laughs>